And our next and last speaker to fight our glucose levels is uh, Alessandro Del Ponte. Uh, come on over, Alessandro. He's, uh, um, Alessandro comes from the Department of Political Sciences here at uh, Stony Brook University, and he's going to talk to us about the, politic the politics of prudence. So um, interesting experience of uh, what happens in, uh, during times of economic austerity. And if it doesn't ring a bell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me today. Uh, so this is uh, joint work with Peter De Scholis, another Italian American, who is my advisor, and we are at the Center for Behavioral Political Economy. We do all sorts of things at the intersection between political science, economics, and psychology. Um, <coughs> so, well, you probably know these two guys here. Uh, this is on the left, uh, Mario Draghi, the president of the European Central Bank. On the right, we have Wolfgang. Schäuble, the uh, German finance minister, and who knows for how long, even that this weekend there are elections in Germany. Um, so sometimes we say that the picture uh, has more than a thousand words, and you can see the disagreement between the two guys, right? <laughs> yeah, Some, someone won and someone lost, maybe, or maybe not. But so the idea is, uh, uh, Italians know very well that, ha that there's been a, a long debate about austerity, what sh governments should do uh, in times of economic hardship. How should the government respond to that, right? And we know that in the north, where Germany especially, which was championing the idea that governments should uh, react to uh, an economic downturn with austerity, so with reducing uh, spending, right? Uh, whereas uh, others, Italians, uh, <laughs> certainly on the forefront of this, uh, argue uh, that uh, uh, austerity is the wrong response and governments should, on the contrary, um, respond with more spending, okay, after the downturn. But it turns out that this debate is not just in politics, but is also reflecting a debate in political economy. Uh, so on the left, uh, for instance, we have Lord Keynes. Uh, and on the right, we have Milton Friedman. So Keynes uh, is, a, uh, is a champion of uh, uh, spending more after a crisis, right, after a downturn. Whereas Friedman uh, uh, would say it doesn't really matter what the government does, because in the end, uh, uh, everything will generate uh, more inflation, or actually it could be counterproductive if you, uh, if you actually spend uh, more as a government. And the reason is because really all this debate about austerity versus deficit spending boils down to how will actual citizens spend after downturn. So Keynes would, would say, well, they will respond to, to you know, in, income fluctuations, whereas Friedman would say, no, there is a permanent income hypothesis, which means people, no matter how much the income is fluctuating, will always kind of spend uh, you know, the same amount in an optimal fashion, considering all their, you know, uh, future and past uh, income uh, over time, right? So this is really what it boils down to, I argue. So that's our research question. How do people spend and save resources after economic windfalls and downturns? So, um, and as you can see, there's a big tension between two schools of thought. So just to recap, we have uh, contrasting theories. So the rational saving hypothesis would say that people aim to spend their long-term average income each period. right? Um, and so it doesn't really matter, again, if you are experiencing a boom or a bust. right? Um, then there is the temporal discounting hypothesis, which has been quite popular, uh, especially in behavioral economics more recently. Um, say, uh, in the 90s with Leibson and uh, even afterwards. So people would spend too much just because of the way they discount the future. Uh, at least no, now we are pretty hungry, I would say. So we would just, you know, maybe uh, uh, prefer really to, 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 to spend a lot of money to get as much food as possible right now, and, and maybe in a possibly inconsistent fashion. Um, and then there's the ownership hypothesis, which we are advancing in this kind of work. Uh, that suggests that people aim to conserve their savings, uh, and so they understand uh, after an economic downturn. 
um, the idea would be that people really don't like relinquishing their owner their their, their uh, resources after they own it own them right so something newly found versus something that is yours that has been yours for some time well that's different people view that in different ways uh, and so we are contrasting these theories here to uh, uh, understand uh, exactly how people will react to uh, to hardship. So let's uh, consider a simple decision problem at this point. Let's see how previous literature has looked at this uh, issue. So in the past, uh, uh, spending and saving decisions have been looked at using uh, mostly standard intertemporal choice tasks. So imagine being an individual here today, September 23rd, considering the following problem. You can have a bunch of dollars, save five bucks today, or you can have, you know, say some more, uh, so like, say seven bucks in a month from now. And so then we would see uh, how consistent you are in, this, uh, in these preferences. Um, but the, the thing that we are arguing is that this task uh, that has been widely used to study these problems doesn't really capture uh, savings. So there's no real ownership feeling when you, when, you, when you are comparing these decisions. These seem a bit abstract decisions. And also, you don't have really uh, an ownership uh, component. You don't actually store anything here, right? And yet, this is the way economists have studied saving, uh, typically in the past. And uh, the other component is that there is no really uh, rational benchmark here. So you can, of course, uh, pick whatever you want. We can compare this particular choice between today and a month from now and compare it with other types of problems and see how consistent or inconsistent you are. But yet there is no performance benchmark. Like There is no way of saying, oh, this kind of choice is just you know, inherently better than another choice. Okay? except for consistency. So what we aim to do is introducing these two missing pieces, so the ownership and the performance benchmark. And so here you see what our idea was. Do we have Wi-Fi actually here? So am I allowed to use the internet? Then uh, one thing to be done could be, if I can look at the, could be to, um, let's see to actually play the game for you guys. OK, let's see if I can. The mouse is a bit, uh, let's see, control. Yeah, it doesn't, it's fine. I can't uh, make it work for now, but probably I can access the internet because it's nice to see things uh, you know, at work. Um, so here we designed the national budget game, as you can see. Uh, and while uh, the page loads, uh, I can describe what, uh, what is going on here. So in this game, you do what is probably in the dreams of many of you, which is be the president of the United States of America. Um, and you get to control the national budget. And so now we'll see. Great. Sounds realistic, right? And you can bombard uh, North Korea if you want. Um, anyway, national budget game. OK. So here, these will be the instructions. This is the way to pull it up a bit. OK, yes, perfect. So I programmed this game. OK, this is the map of the United States. Um, as you can see, we have a starting health, a starting well-being as a, as a nation, right? OK. And we are in power for a few months. And our goal is to maximize uh, uh, our, our uh, length of stay in office, right? So maximize the number of months in which we can maintain the nation's well-being above zero. Right, And uh, yeah, sometimes we experience economic downturns, so we don't get any tax dollars, as you can see. However, each period, the nation has its needs. So the well-being of the nation goes down by 50 points. As you saw, we are down at 250. right? And it will keep going down. So this is a prolonged recession, for instance, in our game. 
So you'd have the people there with their needs, and this on the left would be the, the national treasury. This is a particularly unlucky uh, uh, <laughs> strike, OK? But at some point, hopefully, magically, tax dollars will appear, right? And we'll have, uh, let's see how unlucky we get. No, today we, we are lucky, actually. And we get some dollars, and we can spend them on the people. And as you may notice, there are diminishing marginal returns. So the first tax dollar you spend is worth 10 points, the second 9 points, the third 8, et cetera, et cetera. You see, you see the value of each tax dollar stack going down. But we can also store our dollars for future for you know future consumption just in case we get other bad days. So for instance, today we got six. So we are simulating here, as you can see, um, a situation where we get normal days, in which case normal days would have um, either seven or six dollar stacks. Um, that you can spend on the people, and you see well-being is going up as I as I spend, or downturn days. And we started this uh, demonstration with uh, a bunch of downturn periods, in which it's important to have precautionary savings because you know these these dollars that you save here are really key, uh, you know, to make uh, uh, the most bang of your buck. Because you can see the tension here. The tension is spend everything today, right, to increase our well-being today versus saving for the future, right? And the tension is, uh, is created by the fact that you have these diminishing returns. So if I spend everything today, yes, I... I